I am so excited to be here today. Like I said, I am Kim, and I am our youth pastor here for our 180 Youth Ministries. I love it. Yes, I love my, my youth fam. Um, like I said, also, pastor on vacation. So if you're like, that doesn't look like Pastor Ray. Not Pastor Ray. So he is on vacation, but he will be here next week with us. So um, yeah, just be praying for the, the trip back home. Um, with his family. So my youth students know that I have some weird fears and I will not be telling the really weird ones because I will never live it down. <laughs> so if my youth family wants to share with you later about what those weird, really weird fears are, they can go ahead and I give you permission, but I will not be sharing that today. But some of my other weird fears, I'm afraid of the dark. I know. I'm 27 and I'm afraid of the dark. I'm one that like when I have to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night I take my phone flashlight all the way up, you know, and I'm like And I run to my door in my room and turn on my room light I literally turn on the light in my room because I don't I'm scared of the dark And then I like open the door and my bathroom's like right there and I'm like first you gotta show the flashlight Is anything there? No? And then you run over and you turn the flash or turn the light on really fast and yes, even when I'm like going to bed at night, or even after I go to the bathroom, I am one that like holds the light, and as I'm looking at the bed, and I turn it off and I run to bed. <laughs> I don't know, I'm just afraid of the dark. I have this weird fear, randomly, not all the time, that when I'm going 80 miles an hour down the highway, down the interstate, all four tires, they're just gonna fall off. <laughs> yeah, who fears that? No, <laughs> horrible. And I fear roller coasters. You'll probably see me on a roller coaster, but I have to like psych myself out while I'm waiting in line. And what do you think is like the worst part of a roller coaster? <laughs> okay, oh, Rob actually got it. I thought somebody would say like the, the first drop or something. Rob got it. When you are pulling away from the station, and there's usually like a turn, so you like turn and then it's like ching, 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 ching. And what do you do? You see sky. How is there after that, like you, you're just looking at the sky. I'm like screaming. It's almost like you're like you're just like because I'm just like screaming. It's terrifying. I don't know. I fear fears, but I also I fear some deeper things too. I feared a lot of things in my past. I fear that I will lose my family. I've feared that I will be at a dead end job, minimum wage that wasn't even close to where my calling was to ministry and that was, that was gonna be my life. I've been afraid of change, I've been afraid of the salvation of my friends, even my own salvation. I've been afraid of finances, afraid of lack of knowledge. We're talking about fear today. Fear like Moses. Now, I want you to know this is not a how to be afraid like Moses, okay? <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> this is a guide to know how, like, Moses, he had a lot of fearful situations in his life. How did he overcome them to become one of those heroes that we know of in the Bible today? How can we overcome our fear? And how can we lead others through their fear? Well, I know we have all feared something. Maybe you are in that fear place right now. Or maybe there's fear coming. We may feel afraid at times, but we know the one who takes away all fear. We know the one who stands between us and those fearful situations and tells us that he'll hold us and provide for us. We know the one who faced fear and overcame it. We know the one who holds our past, our present, and our future and promises us greater things than anything in this world. We know Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And if you don't know him today, I want to share with you how powerful he can be as an advocate for you. If you don't know Jesus today, I want you to get a glimpse of what Jesus, who Jesus is. And as we prepare ourselves today, I want you to just think about, about those things, about how God can be our overcomer. God, I just invite you into this place today. Prepare our hearts now. Lord, bring out that fear in us. It may be scary to even face 
But God, I pray that we can face it with you today, surrounded by this body of believers. That today is the day that, that those things will be overcame. Testimonies will be started today because of your name and you conquering that fear in us, God. Prepare our hearts today. In your name, God, amen. So as I've been reading my devotions this year, Moses just keeps popping up. And I don't know how God speaks to you, but God always speaks to me through the things that I already know, or I thought I already knew. So, meaning, I grew up in the church, like born and raised in the church. You hear about John 3.16. You got your Daniel the Lion's Den. You know, like all of these stories that you're like, yep, know that one, yep, know that one. But God always uses those stories to teach me something new, which I love. Because then I feel like it's also like a humbling situation too. You know, it's not like, oh yeah, I know the Bible. And then you read it and you're like, I didn't know that happened. And I felt like that happened a lot as I was reading Moses. I feel like I have a lot of the same tendencies. I feel like I have a lot of the same fears. But I also know that I am called something great just like Moses was. And so are you. Let's set up the story of Moses. Maybe some of you don't know Moses. I'm gonna go through Exodus like you have never seen before. So, <laughs> hold on, get ready. Um, as you read this, I want you to go back in and read Exodus and the story of Moses. Um, it's powerful. So, let's start this. Moses was born in a time of fear. So when Moses was born, it was actually, they were killing all of the baby boys that were born Hebrew because they were afraid that there would be an uprising of, these, of this new generation. They'd be able to start this army against them, and they were also afraid that they would have successors to their family, that they would be able to provide for them, and then they'd just leave the slavery they were in. So they're like, let's kill all the babies born males now so that there's no successors to their families. So they're stuck in slavery here forever. So Moses' mom tried to hide her baby. Moses was born during this time. Moses' mom tried to hide her baby after he was born, but eventually, you know, babies grow up. So eventually he got too big to even hide. So we're going to start reading in Exodus 2, 3. But when she could no longer hide him, she got a basket made of pap papyrus reeds and waterproofed it with her tar and pitch. She put the baby in the basket and laid it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile River. Verse 5 through 9 says, Soon Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe in the river, and her attendants walked along the river bank. When the princess saw the basket among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it for her. When the princess opened it, she saw the baby, and the little boy was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This must be one of the Hebrew children, she said. Then the baby's sister approached the princess. Should I go and find one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you, she asked. Yes, do, the princess replied. So the girl went and called the baby's mother. Take this baby and nurse him for me, the princess told the baby's mother. I will pay you for your help. So the woman took her baby home and nursed him. Wait a second. This baby, who we later know as Moses, was found by the daughter of the one who wanted to kill him, but he wasn't killed. He was actually given back to his mother to be raised until a certain time. How amazing is that? She was being paid for it. She got her baby back how could that even happen? A time of so much fear. There was so much fear around him. Moses' mother feared. The Hebrews feared for their children. The Egyptians feared this, this succession in the line, this uprising. But God turned this into a protection and provision because God had called Moses to something greater. Maybe you were born in a place of fear. Maybe you, your mother didn't want you. Or maybe you've never known your father. Maybe you've never had anything, and so you've just been trying everything just to survive. But I want to tell you that you're here today. He brought you, God brought you through those places of fear and has set you on the firm ground to now accomplish more than you could ever dream of. You overcame, and you're here today. You survived. <laughs> God has something great for you. First, we're going to look at into how Moses feared. So if we keep reading in Exodus 2, 11 through 12, many years later, 
When Moses had grown up, he went out to visit his own people, the Hebrews, and he saw how hard they were forced to work. During his visit, he saw an Egyptian beating one of his fellow Hebrews. After looking in all directions to make sure no one was watching, Moses killed the Egyptian and hid the body in the sand. And it goes on to say that the next day, he came up on two Hebrews by each other. He's like, hey, hey, hey. They're like, what? Are you going to kill us like you killed that Egyptian? He was like, Ugh. Verse 14 says, Then Moses was afraid, thinking, Everyone knows what I did. And Pharaoh tried to kill Moses for what he did, but Moses fled. He ended up in Midian. Moses knew the killing was wrong. Obviously, he looked both ways before he did it. And he, once he was found out, he was afraid. We find ourselves like that so many times. It doesn't have to be murder, but we make a choice, and then we realize, ah, I shouldn't have done that. I knew I shouldn't have done that. And now you're afraid to be found out. So instead of going to God and being like, hey, God, oh, I messed up again. I'm so sorry. I knew better. I shouldn't have done that. Instead of doing that, we hide. We don't come to church. We don't even talk to our body of believers and our Christian support about our struggles and and, and ask for their support in helping us get through those, we just hide because we're afraid. <coughs> I don't want that to happen to you. Romans 8 1 reminds us that there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. So if you are in Christ, there should be no condemnation. We as body of believers, there should be no condemnation, those coming to us. You have the freedom to go to God Repent and then live boldly in his grace. If you are truly repentant when you come to him with those things, don't hide. Don't let them fester. Don't let them keep that distance away from you and God. Moses ends up finding a new life in Midian. He saves the daughters of the high priest, and he actually marries one of them, Zipporah. They stay there in the desert of Midian, serving Jethro, the high priest, um, Zipporah's dad. And one, so many years later, one day, they're in the desert, and Moses is tending his father-in-law's flock, and we see him have an encounter with God. So if you go to Exodus 3, 2, it says, There the angel of the Lord appeared to him, to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. So the Lord spoke to him through that, and he, he was like, don't come any closer, but take your sandals off because you are on holy ground. And he obeyed. There's a voice coming out of a burning bush. You know, <laughs> what would you do? No? Are you going to burn me up? You know, like, yes, okay. And then he hears it say, I am God. And it says in verse 6, it says that he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. So was this like that holy reverent fear? Or was this like, oh, I just got found out fear? I am going to say, I think it's both. I mean, he had spent so many years in the desert. He knew what he did, right? He knew what he did. He probably regretted it. He was living with that guilt for so, many, so long. And then finding the creator... And him saying, like, oh, hey, I'm burning this bush up, but I'm not burning you yet. <laughs> I'm sure he was like, ah, what's coming? But he also knew the respect. He knew seeing God right then and there, that was too much for a human to stand. He was like, I can't even look upon you. I'm not worthy enough to look upon you. From here, God gives Moses instructions to go back to Moses, to Pharaoh, and tell him, and tell the Tell him to let the Israelites go. And also tell the Israelites, hey, God hasn't forgotten about you. He's going to rescue you from your oppression. Moses protests again and again. He's making up excuses. He's like, ah, what? I can't do that. How, how could I do that? And in verse 10 we see, who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? And he continues protesting. In what authority do I speak? Like, what if they ask how I know these things? Like, I don't have any of the tools. I can't speak. Speak. He's just making all these excuses because he's afraid. But God is calling him to something bigger. God is still calling you. It doesn't matter if you're young, if you're old, if you're too experienced, you're not experienced enough. Whatever that excuse is that you think you need to make, 
God's calling you to something greater. It doesn't matter where you're at. Step out in faith and obedience. I love, I heard this from a speaker that said, success isn't measured by the results, it's measured by your obedience. So are you being obedient? That's success right there. You can be staring fear in the face, but if you step out in obedience, oh, that's so pleasing to God. Not even worrying about what the results are. In Exodus 4, we, they're still at the burning bush. God speaks to Moses telling him that he has given his brother him, his brother Aaron, to speak. He's given him this staff. He's going to do miraculous signs and wonders through him. He's provided everything. By the time that Aaron and Moses had gotten to Pharaoh to even like present this request, they were 80 and 83 years old. They were necessarily spring chickens. <laughs> still young. Young at heart. But they were going in obedience. It doesn't matter how old you are or how any of those things, those excuses. Tear those down and walk in obedience. When God called me into ministry, this is the passage that spoke to me. I had these same thoughts and fears as Moses. Surely I can't preach. Like, what gives me the authority to tell these people about you and lead them? Like, I can't do this. But when I read that verse, you know how I told you, whenever I read passages that I thought I knew, God always like reveals something new to me. So back that day in college, so many years ago, when I read that passage for the hundredth time, I realized that God's going to equip me. That he's called me to it, so he's going to equip me. He confirmed that in that time that I spent alone with him. And he used verses like John 1.12 to remind me, but to all who believed in him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. I accepted him. I have become a child of God. God has given you, as our Christ follower, authority to walk in him. Live it out for his glory. Not being afraid of anything else, but live confidently in God and where he's calling, where he's leading you. And even beyond that, in John 14, 12, it says, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I am going to be with the Father. Jesus was saying, okay, I'm not going to be here forever, but I'm sending the Holy Spirit, and he's going to work in and through you. So that is a message for another time. But I want you to know that when you accept Jesus in your life, you also have the Holy Spirit as an advocate inside of you to fight these things, to fight against this fear and these excuses. You have the Holy Spirit because you've accepted Jesus into your heart. I think one of the coolest things about these instructions that God gave to Moses was that he also proved himself to Moses. He wasn't just like, okay, go for it, do this, do that. He said in Exodus 4, 4, after God had told, turn Moses' staff into a snake. So this like shepherd's staff, he turned it into a snake. He then said, then the Lord told Moses, reach out and grab his tail. So Moses reached out and grabbed it and it turned back into a shepherd's staff in his hand. Now, first of all, God didn't make no gardener snake. <laughs> like, I don't like snakes. He wasn't like, oh, there's the cute little snake just grabbed by its tail. No, this staff was going to do powerful, miraculous things. What do you think the size of that serpent was? <laughs> that thing was going to be huge. That was a whomper. And God's like, hey, just pick it up. I got you. Turn back into a staff. And it was as if God was saying, hey, take the smaller end, and I'll take hold of the bigger end. He had to have faith that that would actually turn back into a staff. But he had to take, be obedient. He had to take the, the step forward. He had to follow where God was taking him. God was giving him authority to do miracles. But God was also saying, hey, I won't let it bite you in the end. I've got the control of it. And I'm going to be there for you through it all. Because it's God's work, not Moses' work. And I wanted to clarify that too. I think as I was you know, preparing this message and going over it, I was like, I hope they see that I'm not saying, hey, be Moses or be a staff. I'm saying, let God equip you to do his work and give the glory back to God. I want you to see that through this message. So after all this instruction from God's voice, Coming out of this burning bush, Moses goes back 
to Egypt. He takes his family. His brother Aaron goes with him. He's being obedient to God. So I love Psalms 23, 4. It says, even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. So I want you to know that this is actually David saying this. But I just see Moses having to say that to himself as he's traveling back to Egypt, being like, I'm going to face all of these people and be like, hey, let this whole nation, all of your slaves, go. He had to, I feel like he had to say this over, I just see that as he's walking, as they're traveling, as, as they're making their way back. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. I want you to, to remember this. Either write it down, take a picture of it, post it somewhere, because if you aren't in that dark valley right now, it's going to come at some point, and you have to be prepared for it. Be prepared with this verse to just speak it out. Like, no, I am remembering that God is with me. He's given me the strength to face whatever comes. So in Exodus 7, it recounts the story of Moses and Aaron going to Pharaoh, pleading with him to let the Israelites go. And just to worship God, but he refused. So just like how God had directed, Moses and Aaron took their staff, and it turned into a serpent. And then Pharaoh was like, oh, nah, I'm not calling for that. So he takes his magicians, and they turn staffs into snakes. But they're magicians. What do they do? They do tricks. So God had made these miracles happen through this staff of Moses and Aaron's, but Pharaoh was twisting it to make it into a trick. I can just imagine, though, what Moses was thinking when, like, the magician's staffs, like, turned into snakes. I can just imagine him being like, ah, what now? <laughs> of course. Didn't prepare me for this one. But a second later, that staff of Moses and Aaron's ate the snakes of those magicians. Yes, snakes, plural. Like, that's how big this serpent was. Remember I said it was an old gardener snake? Yeah, it wasn't. This serpent was huge, and it overcame any tricks that Pharaoh was going to come after him, was going to throw at him. And he overcame, they were able to see these miracles. And Pharaoh's officials feared. So as we look at these plagues, um, that followed, the fear shifted. So I want you to, to read Exodus chapter 7 through 11. Uh, we're not going to go through every single plague, but those are the plagues that basically they went to Pharaoh and they're like, hey, let our people go. And Pharaoh was like, no. And they were like, okay, well then God is going to send this plague on your people. And Pharaoh was like, prove it. He's like, okay, well. And it happened again and again. Pharaoh was like, no, you can't take them. No, you can't take them. Yeah, you can take them. No, just kidding, you can't. It was like on and on and on. And they kept coming, but Pharaoh's officials were like catching on. <laughs> oh, this is going to keep happening. Like, God is mighty. This is something to be feared. We need to fear him. Like, Pharaoh, come on, are you sure? When the hailstorms came, when the locusts came, like everything, it was like, they were like getting it. They were like, I am fearful. After the final plague, it was the plague of the death of the firstborn, in the Egyptians' family. It brought so much fear. Pharaoh was finally like, just go. Take everything. Just leave. We can't handle this anymore. So after the Israelites, being in that land for 430 years, being slaves for generations, going through such hard oppression, they were now free. And in Exodus 12, 51, it says, on that very day, the Lord brought the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt like an army. Like an army. The very thing that that Pharaoh so long ago was so worried about happening, so he killed all of those baby boys, now is happening. Like man can't stand in the way of what God's going to do. I just love that God had redeemed his people using one of those surviving babies from so, so far back. He knew it was going to happen. He knew that he needed, that he was going to do greater things. I just love how God works. When we want to 
handle our own revenge. We need to step back and we need to let God do his justice. It was almost like that time, like, okay, I was so fearful and now, okay, now, 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 we're, now we're free. Yeah, what now? But you're still like a little bit fearful in you. And God's like, I have so much justice, I'm gonna take care of the situation. We don't need to take it into our own hands. The Israelites walked out of Egypt free because Moses had said yes to God and didn't let fear stop him from following what God had for him. So once the Israelites were free, they were out of there, they were remembering, they were celebrating, and they're like, every year we're going to remember what God did and just celebrate Him. And they were so excited, they were living on a high, they settled in by the sea, and they're like, all right, we are free. And that's when God continues their story. God speaks directly to Moses, and he's like, hey, just so you know, Pharaoh's coming after you. And once Pharaoh and his, his officials realize, like, oh, all of our slaves are gone, like, now we're just mad. They regretted their decision. They came after him. They harnessed chariots and troops. And they just went full force at Israel, the Israelites. And the Israelites feared. Moses wasn't afraid. The Egyptians, they weren't afraid anymore because they were just mad. But the Israelites feared. Exodus 14.10 says, As Pharaoh approached the Israelites, the people of Israel looked up and panicked when they saw the Egyptians overtaking them. God had brought them through that safety or through that freedom of Pharaoh, but now it looked like they were going to be overtaken again. And they were complaining and they were saying stuff like, it's better to be a slave in Egypt than a corpse in the wilderness. They're just complaining that they're basically going to die. And Moses, with such grace, and trying to comfort them so calmly, and he's like, in Exodus 14, 13, it says, don't be afraid, just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. The Egyptians you see today will never be seen again. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. Now, I don't want you to think, because then the verse goes on, the next verse goes on to say, yeah, but God was like, okay, like now, like get moving. So it wasn't like Moses was like, hey, let's all go in the corner and sit on our hands and do nothing. Yeah, who wasn't doing that? He was like, hey, guys, remember what God did? He's going to take care of it. So let's not run around in a tizzy trying to control it all and take care of it ourselves. Like, stay calm, because God's got this. And remember that part where it says, the Egyptians you see today will never be seen again, because we're going to bring that back. So Exodus 14, 16 says, God told Moses, pick up your staff and raise your hand over the sea. Divide the waters so that the Israelites can walk through the middle of the sea on dry ground. And in verse 22 it says, so the people of Israel walked through the middle of the sea on dry ground with walls of water on each side. Moses' faith proved to be in the right place. That staff that God had used so many times before, he was using it again, and he brought this mighty wind to push the water to one side and the other side up, so it was like this wall of water as they walked through on dry ground to the other side. As the last person was safely on the other side, God made the waters go back. And it was when the Egyptians were in that area, where were in the water, because they were coming after them, right? We read that. So the second half of verse 28 says, Of all the Egyptians who had chased the Israelites into the sea, not a single one survived. So remember when we were reading in verse 13? They're like, Ah, oh, Moses, we should have just stayed there and been slaves and all this stuff. He's like, But the Egyptians that you see today, they're going to be gone today. And then right here we see all of them that followed, not a single one survived. He was stepping out and speaking in faith. We need to speak out in faith. So there was a quote, Martin Lloyd-Jones says, and he says, faith is refusal to panic. And I feel like Moses took that opportunity before they even went into the sea to say, I'm not gonna panic, I'm gonna have faith. In those moments that God calls you to something, you're standing there and then you're like faced with an impossible situation. You're like, how do, how do I even like overcome this? Don't panic. Stay calm and have faith. Lean in to God. Because then you'll be able to lead others through their fear if you're able to lean into God during yours. What is this whole thing about? Why? Like, now what? Okay, now they're gone, but where did these people go? Where are they going? 
So God actually told their ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he said that he would bring them to a promised land. So on the other side of this Red Sea, God continued to lead them to this promised land. And it was a land that was full of milk and honey. It was lacking nothing. But how many of us know that the desert isn't always a fun place to be? As they traveled along on their way to this promised land, the Israelites feared much. They're like, oh, I'm hungry, we're gonna die of starvation. I'm thirsty, we're gonna die of thirst. And then these armies came up and he was like, well, you're gonna win these, you know, these battles anyways. And they're like, yeah, but they're tall and there's so many of them. And they're just like, feared and complained on and on. And Moses, he's just like, yeah, okay. <laughs> At one point he went up to spend more time with God. So God, the one that's leading them through all this to a promised land that is lacking nothing. He goes and he spends time with God. Apparently the man was taking way too long because the people got impatient. They feared. They're like, oh, Moses is taking a long time. Maybe he's lost. Let's make a golden calf and worship him like an idol. <laughs> what? You know you're not supposed to do that. Why would you do that? The fear kept leading them astray. Moses had grown past his fear into this intimate relationship with God. But these people hadn't gotten that yet. They hadn't spent that quality time with God. In Exodus 34, it actually says that when they would see Moses' face after spending time with God, it was radiating from God's presence. And they didn't want to come close to him. They feared even being near him. And as people who know God, they know him. Wouldn't you be attracted to that? Wouldn't you say, hey, you have this? How do you have this? Where did you get this? Like, I want to know more. I want to radiate like that. But no, it's like they had a taste of God, but they had put so much distance between them and God that they were foreign to the concept of God's presence. Don't let that happen to us. Don't stay away from God so long that you fear the very presence of God in others. You can be in that place where you radiate God's joy and his love and his presence if you spend the time with him. Don't be afraid to come near him. He's not going to like smite you right there. He loves you. He has so much grace that I can't even begin to understand. Come to him. Spend time with him. Listen to him. He has so much to share with you and so much to empower you with. But you have to spend time with him. God has made everything beautiful for its own time, Ecclesiastes 3.11. So God doesn't allow the hardships just to happen just for fun. It's like a learning experience. <laughs> you got to learn. When you were learning to walk and you fell, or when you maybe cheated on your first test, you got found out. Those things, the whatever happened afterwards, you know, the falling and hurting or <laughs> the consequences from cheating, those things happen so that you would learn. That you don't keep living the way you're living that you learn from your mistakes, that you, you keep growing, keep going. Those times where you're in the wilderness, how, how can be a time of learning? It was in the wilderness that Moses picked up that staff that God used for miraculous times. The wilderness that's just harsh, barren, probably boring at times, but it was a place that he picked up a staff, just thinking, hey, I'm equipped with a staff, I'll take this, and God used it to do miracles. God will use you to lead people through their own wilderness if you can just lean into God through yours. Stay close and he'll bring you through with more knowledge than you had before. So then in Deuteronomy we see the, the fruit of the fear of the Israelites. So Moses was, Moses was supposed to share with the Israelites, hey, by the way, this generation is not going to be able to see or get into the promised land because of all that happened. Not even Moses got into the promised land. He saw it, but he died right outside of it, not being able to go into the promised land. But their children, they were able to see and go into the promised land and be in that place flowing with milk and honey, lacking nothing. They got that promise. I love what Stephen Furtick says. He says, you either kick fear out of your heart or it will keep you out of the places God has prepared for you. 
so true. This generation left the fear in their heart, and it kept them from the place that God had prepared for them. Deuteronomy 31.6 says, So be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid and do not panic before them. For the Lord your God will personally go ahead of you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. And I love this because this isn't just like, I'm taking this out of context somewhere, and I'm like, oh, this fits the story perfectly. This is literally in this story. Moses was saying, hey, as this generation, as you're going up, learn. Learn from the ancestors before you. Don't fear. He's saying, hey, God went before you in this land. He's going to conquer anything that's there. Walk boldly into it. Don't be afraid. He will never, God will never abandon you. And at the age of 120, Moses died, knowing the Lord face to face. We all have to deal with those consequences. There will be learning. His grace is like that. He wants you to learn. You can overcome the fear you were born into and brought up in because of the choices you made. Moses did. You can obey God's directions without fighting it on him because then you don't have to fear like the, the Pharaoh's officials did. Moses conquered those that had that fear. You can see the promised land or that promise that God has for you by spending the time with God, knowing him deeply and letting him know you deeply. And following his leading into the unknown, Moses led the way for others through that. So in closing, I would just actually like everyone to stand with me you would. And if I could have my prayer team just prepare to come up to the front to be available to pray. Maybe you are in this place and you don't have a relationship with God. Even at the very beginning, you, you didn't have a relationship with God. Or maybe you were born into a place of fear. A place that just kept pushing you down, pushing you down. You weren't able to, to, to do anything else because you were just trying to survive. Maybe you were in a place where you aren't obeying God's directions and you now know that you're being stubborn to what God has for you because of that fear. Maybe you were here today and have so much fear that though you were once, you once had a close relationship with God, now that concept of that closeness is just foreign to you. So I want everyone to close their eyes, bow their heads. With every eye closed and head bowed, I want you to respond today to one of these three things. If you are in this room and you would like a relationship with God that you've never had before, I want you to raise your hand right now as a declaration of, I want to change my life, and I need God's help. If you were declaring today that you want salvation in Him. Now, if you are in that second place, you aren't following the plans you know God had for you because you're afraid of going forward and trusting God. Maybe you're being stubborn in the plans that God has for you, with every eye bowed, or a head bowed and eyes closed, I want you to raise your hand if that is you. Yes. Thank you. You can put your hands down. And lastly, if you once had a relationship with God, but you need a refreshing of Him, you need to rededicate your life to Him, saying, I'm not going to live in that fear. I'm going to be like that new generation who has all this wisdom now of what to do, and I'm going to go forward boldly. You, you need to rededicate your life to God. I want you to raise your hand right now. Yes. Thank you. You can put your hands down. God is so good. He sees you. God, I thank you so much for this morning. God, for those that are coming to you that have never come to you before, God, I pray that you would fill them with grace and hope. Lord, those of us who have been stubborn to what you've called us to, I pray that we would not
not live in fear and hold ourselves back, but God, that we would just step out in faith and follow you. And God, for those of us who need to rededicate our lives to you today, God, we step into that unknown, but with faith and with strength. Lord, we rededicate our lives to you today, and we're not looking back. Take away that fear. Fill us with faith. I thank you so much for the lives changed in this place today. We dedicate our lives to you today and every day, and we walk into your presence every moment of our day. God, be with us as we go from this place, and I pray that you would continue to help us overcome. And in your name we pray, amen. Amen. If this time, if you are one of those that raised your hand, I would love for you to come up and pray with our prayer team. It's praying in agreement with somebody else. Or if you just are like, I just need this time to, to stay and sit in God's presence, I want you to come up to the altar and just be here. Just let God speak to you. Let God change your life and ask for prayer. That's what we're here for. That's what we talked about too. Is that we're a body of Christ. We're body of believers. Don't run and hide. It's so easy to do and we've all done it. Come up here and, and just present yourself before God and say, hey God, I want more of you. I want to rededicate my life. I want to move past that stubbornness. <coughs> Come at this time and if you are feeling that you need to leave, <coughs> excuse me, then I pray that you would just go out boldly in God's presence, that you would just be safe if you go from this place, that you would have a great rest of your day, that you would be in the hands and feet of Jesus as you go from here, <coughs> excuse me, and have a great rest of your Sunday. Thank you all so much.